So in this section, we'll talk about answering more questions with advanced RAG. We've talked about both the basic um, RAG setup about how that works. We talked a little bit about the pain points, failures, as well as how to evaluate your current RAG setup. So now that you have all that in place, it's time to think about how can we more principally solve some of these pain points through a more structured fashion. Basically, given a pain point, what are the set of techniques I can do to try to actually improve my RAG system for different capabilities? One way of looking at this is an easy to hard axis. So on the left, th these are techniques that are less expressive, easier to implement, and incur lower latency and cost. On the right, you have techniques that are more expressive, harder to implement, and incur higher latency and cost. And so we, th there's basically table stakes techniques that you can try to actually incrementally improve your RAG system. This includes better document parsers, measuring uh, and trying out different types of chunk sizes, um, adding basic retrieval parameters like hybrid search and metadata filters on top of your RAG pipeline to see if metrics basically go up. There's also more advanced retrieval techniques. For instance, you could take advantage of Active Loop Deep Memory, which we'll uh, talk about in just a second. You can include advanced retrieval stuff like re-ranking, some in-house llama index context concepts like recursive retrieval as well as small to big retrieval, as well as being able to deal with embedded tables. On the right half, you have techniques that will basically fundamentally increase the capabilities of your RAG pipeline. So they'll actually be able to do more things. Uh, but these things typically involve one higher upfront and also marginal latency and cost. And they also typically are a little bit harder to implement in tune. This includes adding a genetic behavior to your RAG pipeline. So making it an agent so that it's capable of stuff like query planning, answering questions between structured and unstructured data, routing, and of course, actually fine tuning uh, like the LLM and the embedding uh, yourself so that it exhibits better performance. Another way of looking at these different techniques, though, is a table of what are the set of pain points that a user typically faces when building a standard RAG pipeline? And what are the set of solutions that resolve uh, each pain point? So let's first take a look at some example pain points. Some of the most common pain points that we hear from our users is one, the retrieval is bad, so you're not able to get back the relevant context, whether it's low precision or low recall. Being able to handle structured and unstructured data, a lot of times users not only have just a massive text corpus, they also have structured annotations they have on top of that data, and it's unclear whether or not they should put it in some sort of SQL database or just keep it within a, a vector database. There's being able to parse embedded tables uh, within, or, or just basically complex objects within complex documents. So being able to parse uh, embedded objects like tables and graphs within, for instance, a PDF requires maybe slightly more sophisticated ingestion retrieval concepts than just the naive top K rag setup. And then lastly, users tend to want to ask a lot of different types of questions and want to ask, for instance, multi-part questions, things that require the, the LLM to really reason over what makes sense in terms of the different steps. And there's basically different things, again, from easy to hard that you can add to your RAG pipeline to increase the sophistication and allow it to answer more advanced questions. First, let's take a look at uh, the first pain point, which is that retrieval uh, might be suboptimal. And the first thing we'll talk about is deep memory, which is by Active Loop. So what is deep memory? Deep memory is a module within um, Deep Lake by Active Loop that significantly increases Deep Lake's vector search accuracy up to 22% on average. It's basically a tiny neural net layer that's trained to, given a user query, match it with relevant data from your text corpus, right? And so if you take a look at this diagram and, and during training, given any sort of uh, data that you feed it, input uh, context and also query data, you're essentially like training this neural net module on top of your own data domain. So instead of using, for instance, like a pre-training embedding model where you just download an off-the-shelf hugging face model, this module actually is actually training based on data that you feed it, the, the question and context pairs. Then when you're actually ready to deploy this in production, you can basically uh, activate deep memory. So it's an inference mode. And get, given any sort of production user queries, uh, use this uh, kind of the, the embedding setup along with deep memory to basically have a more optimized embedding representation that's able to give you better retrieve results uh, versus something from a pre-trained embedding model. 
some basic stats here. Uh, you can get up to 22% higher retrieval accuracy with Deep Lake Steep Memory compared to, for instance, just using an off-the-shelf uh, vector database and off-the-shelf embedding models. And of course, embedding search itself does better than, for instance, pure lexical search uh, with BM25. Deep Memory has a native integration with Llama Index. And so we actually have some metrics that show that retrieval performance increases by like 15 to, to 25% when you actually have deep memory enabled across hit rate, MR, and other ranking metrics. And so if you take a look at the top blue box that the top row shows with deep memory top 10 eval, the second row shows without deep memory top 10 eval. And the hit rate is 65% compared to 50%. MR is 24 or 25% compared to 21%. And there are some qualitative examples in the green and red box that show that given different types of questions, uh, there's actually questions that with deep memory, this like fine tune embedding layer enabled, it actually gives you the relevant context and allows you to answer the question compared to the query result without deep memory. So if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Another a chart here shows that uh, it basically gives you like sub-second highly accurate search. And so if you look at a recall at K across the x-axis, that deep memory it goes from 51% to 87% and is higher than uh, a baseline vector search uh, as well as baseline elastic with uh, BM25. That's deep memory. You should definitely check it out. And of course, Llama Index also has a wealth of advanced retrieval concepts to basically try out and explore that improved retrieval performance beyond what just top K embedding lookup can. One of these concepts that I want to talk about today is small to big retrieval. This is actually a pretty important concept. We've talked about and presented about this uh, in a variety of other settings as well, but it's a very interesting concept to, to think about. So the intuition here is that if you think about what the naive rag stack consists of, it's the fact that you're using basically the same text chunk uh, for embeddings as well as for synthesis. And another kind of sub uh, optimal point of this is that when you split a big text chunk, you're not really splitting it based on anything. You're defining an arbitrary parameter to split on. And, and so what happens is given some document, you might define the chunk size to be 1024. Uh, it might be splitting on new line separators between paragraphs, but it's not really dependent on the user question, right? It's just uh, this thing that you do to pre-split your data beforehand. So this leads to a lot of issues down the road because let's say you accidentally split the relevant context for a question down the middle then the retrieved context might only have half the context or even like 10% of the context. If the relevant context, for instance, at the end of one chunk, it's very likely that there was more context in the kind of neighboring adjacent chunks that wasn't actually retrieved. And therefore you're not able to have the relevant context to, to actually answer the question fully. The other piece is that smaller um, uh, chunks tend to lead to better retrieval performance for certain types of questions. And this is because the bigger the text chunk is, both the embedding model tends to get confused and the LLM also gets, potentially gets confused if it has a bunch of irrelevant context. So one solution we, that we built is what if you embed the text at the sentence level, right? So when you do retrieval, you actually retrieve relevant sentences. So kind of small chunks given the user question, but then you expand like a, a radius around that window during LLM synthesis. So given a question, right, looking at the diagram below, you could do embedding lookup, fetch the relevant sentences, so things are indexed on the sentence level, and then expand a radius around that to feed in more relevant context. This basically always ensures that assuming your embedding lookup is at least somewhat good, the most relevant context is at the center, and then you can fill it in with surrounding context around the relevant context. So you don't run into these issues of like edge, the edge boundary conditions where you have relevant context at the boundaries of a predefined trunk. We found that this is implemented in Llama Index. We have resources in our production RAG guide on how to set this up. And we typically found that this leads to more precise retrieval. You can simultaneously set a smaller top K and actually give better results than naive retrieval with a higher top K. Another point that I'll quickly touch on, right, is just fine tuning embeddings. Um, of course, deep memory uh, basically allows you to do this under the hood. And so actually, if you're like an AI engineer and you don't have a ton of time on your hands, you want to focus on writing the application logic, you probably should just use uh, in-house service, uh, for instance, like deep memory that can abstract away some of the complexities. But if you also want to just learn how to fine tune embeddings yourselves, um, you can basically do the following process. And it looks very similar to how do you actually define an eval data set for retrieval. You can generate a synthetic query data set from raw text chunks using LLMs. So given some text chunks, use an LLM to generate a set of relevant questions. 
then use this synthetic data set to then fine tune an embedding model. Because now that you have an LLM that generated questions from context, now you have question context pairs, right? So now you have the signal where now given some sort of retriever, right, that's based, that's using embeddings, you can basically compare the predicted response against uh, the ground truth context of what should actually be retrieved. And assuming your retriever is parametric, if it's embedding based, uh, you can actually fine tune uh, the raw embedding model itself, or you can fine tune a black box adapter on top of any sort of embeddings. And this basically allows you to, to create a, transform, a transformation layer on top of your embeddings uh, and to basically better adapt uh, these embeddings towards your data representation and the types of questions you want to ask. This generally tends to squeeze out a few percentage points of better performance. Here's just a general diagram on how do you fine tune a black box adapter. So for instance, given a question, given some sort of fixed uh, embedding model, yeah, even if you're using, for instance, OpenAI, you fine tune a transformation from the generated embeddings from there, a linear transformation, any uh, layer deep neural net, and basically apply that production time to transform your embeddings into something that's more amenable for retrieval. The next topic I want to touch on is handling structured and unstructured data. A lot of times that your data domain is actually uh, semi-structured. So you have a lot of raw text, but you also have structured annotations on top of that text. And a key concept to think about and grapple with is how do you basically leverage metadata filters in different uh, vector databases? For instance, with uh, Active Loop Deep Lake, uh, to actually take advantage uh, of, the, of this for better structured retrieval, and, and this leads to better rack performance. So what is metadata? Metadata is basically structured context you can inject into each text chunk. And so this could be very simple. It could be like a page number. It could be a document title, um, but it could also be a lot more unstructured. It could basically be anything you want. It could be a summary of adjacent chunks. It could be questions that the chunk can answer. An example is just shown in this diagram. If you have a text chunk, let's say of just a paragraph, metadata you can just think about as a JSON dictionary on top of that raw paragraph. What is metadata used for and, and why is it important? There are three main benefits. One is it can help retrieval. So if you actually add more context to each text chunk to basically uh, contextualize it, uh, for instance, adding like a summary of what the overall document is about, then you can actually make sure that given a user question, the relevant text chunks are retrieved. It can augment response quality, right? So given um, kind of a, a user query, or, or given the set of retrieved context, if the LLM can actually see additional metadata information in, beyond just with a raw text chunk in a context window, for instance, if it has access to like the page number or document title, it can um, surface more sophisticated answers and also give you stuff like citations and those types of things. And of course, it integrates with the vector database metadata, metadata filter capabilities. This is all structured information, especially if it's represented as a JSON dictionary. You can integrate with a vector database metadata filter. So what now, what is the metadata filter? Um, to do this, to show this, let's walk through a quick example. Here's a question. Can you tell me the risk factors in 2021? And assume that you have a bunch of, you know, financial reports from, uh, for a given uh, company across different years. If you ask this question, just, and do semantic search, let's say you want to fetch the top four document chunks that can help answer the question. You're not necessarily guaranteed to return the relevant document chunks, um, given this question. You might get stuff from 2020, 2021, 2019. And this is because you didn't uh, like the, like with, within that chunk, it, you're not necessarily one guaranteed to mention the year. And then two, you don't actually know what these embeddings will do, right? Like maybe the embeddings are weighted more by the fact that it talks about risk factors rather than the year. And so even if the year is wrong, you might still retrieve the context because it talks about risk factors. An interesting way to actually blend structured querying with unstructured um, uh, semantic search is that if you can also infer the metadata filters, like year equals 2021, that you can basically remove irrelevant candidates, prune that, and, which leads to higher precision retrieval. And so you basically combine structured filters with semantic search. So given this question, let's say we actually inferred that the metadata filter should be year equals 2021 launch this query against a vector database. Then we actually first filter out every chunk, except the ones where year is actually equal to 2021. And then we run semantic search uh, only on that document set. This basically kind of uh, enforces that 
the retrieve context is more relevant and precise. The next pain point we'll talk about is being able to parse embedded tables um, or basically embedded objects within complex documents. To, to, to tackle this problem, we'll use a mechanism within Lamindex called recursive retrieval to basically model a document graph. The, to frame this problem, how do we actually parse uh, and understand embedded tables and PDFs? If, for instance, given, again, an SEC 10K document, you might have a lot of tables in there about revenue, cost of goods, those types of things. And so if you actually, what we found em empirically, just naively chunk and embed the document, you might, for instance, split a table down the middle with just some, because you treat it as plain text, you might just basically generate an embedding from an entire mess of numbers around that table. And this typically leads to very bad performance because let's say I want to ask a question, what was the revenue across 2021, 2020, 2019? That question, when you do semantic search and the semantic search is over a bunch of nodes and one of the nodes is just a bunch of raw numbers, that table, the relevant table is not going to be retrieved. So instead, what you can do is you can think about modeling your data, not just as a flat list of chunks, but actually as a hierarchical document graph. So um, instead, what, what we typically found leads to better retrieval is parse out this table with some sort of PDF parser. In this example, we use unstructured. Embed a reference summary to this table. Actually use an LM caption this table, right? And by captioning, this will say revenue by country for the years 2019 to 2021. And then use that as the reference node and index that node along with the other pieces of text within the document. This caption is a much better description, right? And much better for embedding purposes than embedding the raw numbers within the table. So when you ask the question, what is revenue? What is revenue in 2020? You actually get back the relevant answer, right? But without recursive retrieval, it actually doesn't fetch the wildland information. So you can't understand what's going on. In this last pain point section, we'll talk about how do you handle more complex questions, right? How do you actually handle more kind of advanced queries that the user might want to ask uh, and, and actually tackle that. Um, and, and a lot of times what we found is that for general top K rag purposes, especially where the LLM only plays a role at the end to synthesize uh, information, um, it's not actually able to handle a lot of questions that might involve, for instance, repeated lookups through a knowledge corpus. Um, or, or handle more complex tasks like summarization. One solution, right? One, one immediate way to at least handle summarization questions is through routing. What is routing? A uh, routing is very basic. Basically, given any sort of input prompt, what a router does is just figure out, given a set of choices, what relevant choices to map this input prompt to. And so it could be a classifier. You can use an LLM, you can use embeddings. Let's say given a question, you know, that the user wants to ask across the RAG pipeline, you can, for instance, route this question to different types of retrievers or query engines or RAG pipelines that are best suited to actually answer this question. A specific use case that we highlight here is that certain types of questions might actually necessitate something better or not better, something different than top K lookup. Uh, if you want to summarize a document, you don't want to just look up the top K most similar uh, chunks from that document you want to return all the context terms from that document. For instance, one architecture that we set up here is what if we set up two query engines? One is a top K rag query engine. The other, just given a question, will return all context from a given document, the relevant document for that question. And so this uh, packaging this all as a black box gives you a query interface that can handle both summarization questions, which will route to the, you know, the, the summary query engine as well as uh, more kind of QA uh, questions about specific facts, um, which will route to the semantic search query engine. 